Um, all right, so, so far for wireless physical issues, are there any questions or comments up to here? Okay, then let's continue with kind of a more high level view. So this was the lowest level really radio transmission. A uh, bit of a more high level view is how can you classify different networks. So we have uh, wi what's generally known as Wi-Fi, wireless local area networks which have a few dozens of meters of range maybe. Um, they're mostly in this 802.11 protocol family uh, and this is always followed by a letter. There's quite a number of different letters by now. Each one is a different standard and uh, is a little, a little faster than the previous one. And most mobile devices actually can, can seamlessly switch between all those standards up to the most recent one. Or at least up to the most recent one when they were manufactured. So it's not that straightforward to um, to update a mobile device to a new wireless standard because often that would involve actually changing the uh, radio hardware due to different frequencies, for example, and so on. Um, then what we also have is wireless personal area networks. So this is basically anything within one or two meters range of myself. Um, usually uses Bluetooth to, for example, connect my watch or a headset uh, or maybe synchronize my phone to my laptop and so on. So this is called personal area networks. And apart from that, what's currently being developed is called wide gig, um, which is also similar to Wi-Fi, but in a much higher frequency band in 60 gigahertz band. And uh, this is intended for wireless displays, for example. You can sort of buy one or two products now, but uh, they don't really, uh, work very reliably because at that frequency range, you um, really need line of sight. So even just a, a desk, for example, just a piece of wood will actually start to block the signal already. So it doesn't have to be made of metal or something. You need really a direct line of sight between the devices. And that's, of course, what makes things a little more difficult to arrange. So this is still work in progress, I guess. Um, on the other hand, so when I just talked about Wi-Fi local area networks. Then we also have what's most generally known as cellular networks. So they cover a wide area, also a wireless wide area wireless network. No, wireless wide area network. Um, and you can, of course, have different, uh, different types. You have the ones which are installed on the ground in, form of, in the form of base stations, 2G, 3G, 4G, and so on. Um, then you can have satellite-based ones where each cell is actually one satellite orbiting the planet. Uh, Iridium, for example, um, you can really buy quite expensive satellite phones which directly talk to those satellites. In a sense, this is also a cellular network. And um, what's important about these is that you often don't have a symmetric allocation of bandwidth. So um, you usually have a much higher downstream bandwidth to the device than upstream bandwidth from the device. Um, so the upstream bandwidth is usually optimized for uh, voice communication. Um, so you just have one channel that's sufficient for, uh, for a, a two-way communication by voice. But uh, in terms of uh, pure data uh, bandwidth, then you get a lot more in the di downstream direction because Again, you uh, only have a very limited, uh, for example, channel bandwidth available. And uh, most people usually consume more data than they produce and transmit. So uh, you can allocate, the uh, basically draw a dividing line in internally in the channel and allocate more bandwidth for the, um, for the transmission downstream than you uh, do for the transmission upstream. And that will get uh, a better user experience for most people because most of the time they actually use the down, downstream function. Okay, and apart from cellular and uh, local networks, you all, uh, have one additional category which are mesh networks. So maybe one of you has heard of Freifunk, which is uh, also uh, distributed in Weimar, uh, for example, which are 
different wireless routers, which each of which basically forms a cell, but also talks to the other cells. And all put together, you can have basically a large area network without really any kind of central infrastructure. So you can remove single routers without uh, the coverage dropping. And uh, if you put in a signal at one end of the network or a message, then it will actually hop from router to router until it reaches uh, its destination or some kind of exit point. On the other hand, if you look at the, the regular cellular networks, then each base station has a, a wired connection, for example, to the, some central switching center. And uh, so, if you take out the switching center, then the whole network will probably stop to, to function um, because the signal can't propagate from cell to cell. But in, in mesh networks, it, ca it can. And for uh, example, if you want to uh, uh, want something like sensor networks where you distribute many sensors around the building, then you don't want to uh, basically put a wire to every sensor. Uh, rather, you want the the signal to hop from sensor to sensor until it reaches some collection point, for example. All right. So um, one more thing which uh, should be mentioned in the topic of different wireless bands are these ISM bands. This stands for industrial, scientific, and medical. They're listed here. So for example, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, 434 uh, megahertz and so on. These are bands which are basically free for everyone to use. So you don't need uh, basically a slot in that big chart of frequency assignments. Um, these bands basically have one slot of their own and they're free for anyone. And for that reason, actually, uh, most wireless equipment which we use is, for example, using these two bands. Um, the other problem, of course, is that if anyone is free to use them, then also stuff like, for example, microwave ovens will use it. So they usually often have uh, internal frequency of like 2.4 gigahertz. And so if the shielding on a microwave oven isn't, isn't perfect, then it might leak a lot of uh, radiation, which is exactly in the same frequency band uh, as we use for, um, for Wi-Fi, for example, and Bluetooth and so on. And might, so if you have a bad microwave, then you might actually uh, basically turn off the Wi-Fi for the whole building as long as your microwave is running. It has been known to happen. Actually, on the uh, flip side, that means that the radiation which is uh, emitted by a mobile device when it's transmitting in the, in the Wi-Fi bands is actually more or less just microwaves. So it will actually for example, heat up your ear if you make a phone call. It will, of course, only heat it up by a very small amount because the antenna is not optimized for that kind of transmission and it's also only a very small amount of power. So a microwave has, I don't know, uh, 900 watts or something and uh, what the uh, mobile device on full transmit power is something or maybe at most uh, 10 milliwatts or something like that. So it's orders of magnitude smaller. but this is the main reason why people are still somewhat worried that using mobile devices for long, very long periods might cause cancer. Because due to the constant absorption of radiation by your, by your tissue, um, there might be some point after, I don't know, 50 years of continued mobile phone usage where you actually start to develop some kind of uh, uh, illnesses due to that. But that's just on the side. Um, for the very same reason, you can also, again, on the flip side, treat tumors with microwaves. So, um, because they absorb the radiation, get heated up, and the, the tumor dies, and the rest of the tissue should stay intact. Um, but again, this is also then uh, a source of interference if we look into uh, wireless communications again. Um, so, yeah. For that reason, that band, because you don't need a separate license, these bands are very crowded. And if you build any device which wants to communicate in there, then you uh, should be prepared for a lot of interference. And that's what all, all current mobile devices actually are. OK, so one or two more uh, pieces of information about how you can actually look at these um, these from a software point of view, basically. So I don't know, have you ever heard of this 
ISO OSI model. One or two people, okay. Um, the idea is that you can separate the communication between uh, two endpoints into the different layers. So on the very lowest uh, layer, we have the so-called physical layer, which is really the hardware. So the, the radio transmitter and receiver and so on. And then we successively stack different layers on top of that. So data link layer, for example, is uh, Roughly speaking, for example, channel allocation in the wireless network, so to make sure that every device has its own channel and doesn't interfere with the other ones. Then we have the network layer, which uh, does basic routing, for example, or collision detection. Transport layer, which also does routing, session layer, and so on and so on. Um, this is a very fine granular division into different layers, but the important part uh, is here that from the point of view of each layer, it looks like it's communicating directly with the same layer on the other side. So the application layer uh, doesn't care about what's below. It just communicates with the application layer on the other side. Same for the other ones. The only one where actual physical communication happens is the physical layer, because there the actual uh, wireless signals are exchanged. Um, and then the data is passed back up the chain, back up the stack until it again reaches the application layer. So this is a bit abstract. I'll show you a more uh, concrete example. Um, if you map this to the, uh, to the internet or to the internet protocols we probably use every day, um, then we have on the lowest layer, we have the link layer. So the names are slightly different, but the, the concept is the same. On, and on the link layer, we have wireless, LAN, 2G, 4G, Ethernet, and so on and so on. On top of that, the internet layer, um, IP, ICMP, and so on, so the low-level protocols. Then on top of that, transport layer, same name as uh, in the ISO model, TCP and UDP. And on the very top, the application layer, the different yeah, application protocols which use TCP, UDP, and so on. Um, does anyone have an idea uh, when you look at the security stuff like SSL, for example, which these can also use, of course, so you can H have HTTP and HTTPS secure. Um, so where does the SSL stuff fit in here? Anyone has an idea, yeah? Hmm? Yeah, you can't, yeah, not actually, I don't think so because it's not actually related to transport. Yeah? Uh, almost. Almost. Yeah, but is that on top of the application layer? Yeah, it's kind of in between actually because you, um, when you use HTTPS, then the actual HTTP protocol remains completely unchanged. It's just wrapped in TLS. So that's kind of an additional layer inserted between those two. So you still have TCP packets, just like with regular uh, HTTP. So it's not actually integrated into the transport layer. And it's also not integrated into the application layer because the HTTP commands also stay exactly the same. It's actually more or less an additional layer in between that um, roughly corresponds to the um, either the session or presentation layer in this, uh, in this uh, model. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's, uh, it fits best basically in between those two. All right. Yeah, that was a, a big block about wireless stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe also a little unsorted at some points. Um, might have to rearrange the, the content a bit still. So are there any, any questions up to here? Any other comments, anything unclear?